It's mid-May 2022, and in St. Petersburg, Russia, the crowd at a rock concert start chanting. What they're saying is, fuck the war, fuck the war, fuck the war. The person who tweeted this is Rubyov Sobol, a member of Alexei Navalny's anti-corruption foundation. The foundation's been banned, she's in exile, Navalny is in jail. But that tweet has been viewed more than two million times. Vladimir Putin may not like it, but there is another Russia. The courage of the Russian opposition to the Kremlin is real and quite extraordinary, and they've been hard at it since he's been in power for the last 22 years. If people think that all Russians are bad, listen up. It's 2014 and Russia is hosting the Winter Olympics in Sochi, but the bill is out of this world. The road rail link from Sochi on the Black Sea to the newly created ski resort up in the mountains costs $5 billion. That's more than the bill for putting NASA's Mars lander on the red planet. Russia's liberal darling, Boris Nemtsov, loves to wind up the Kremlin. It would have been cheaper, he jokes, to have lined this road with Louis Vuitton handbags. Witty, charismatic, handsome, Boris Nemtsov looks like a cherub, interested in sin. He'd been a deputy prime minister under Yeltsin and at one point back in the 90s is tipped for the very top. But then Vladimir Putin turns up with a sex compromat tape on the prosecutor investigating Yeltsin's family. And Putin gets the keys to the Kremlin instead. In the run-up to the 2014 Winter Olympics, Putin is getting stick because of Russia's Neanderthal laws criminalizing gay people. For BBC Panorama, I challenged the Putinist mayor of Sochi about how gay Olympians might be treated. And then I put his answer to Boris Nemtsov. His reaction gives you some idea of why the best of Russia loved Boris Nemtsov so. The mayor told me that there were no gays in Sochi. No gays? No, no, no homosexuals. <laughs> as far as I know, there are several gay clubs in Sochi. <laughs> How they survive? Why they are not bankrupt? One year later, in February 2015, Nemtsov is on the bridge, 100 yards from the Kremlin, when he's shot dead. When I hear the news, I burst into tears. A man was found guilty of pulling the trigger and has been convicted, but as ever in Putin's Russia, who ordered the hit remains unknown. Nemtsov was loved on his own account, but also for the possibility he represented as someone who could bring change. His supporters built a shrine on the bridge by the Kremlin where he fell with flowers and photos. The authorities knocked it down. The Nemtsov supporters put a new one back up and this happened on repeat until the Kremlin caved in and the shrine was made permanent. But Nemtsov was no more. You already heard in episode four how Putin later effectively killed the career of one of his other rivals, Mikhail Kasyanov, who gets sex complimented with his lover, Natalia Pelevina. So that's two powerful opponents out of the way. That leaves one man standing. Alexei Navalny is an extraordinary figure, funny, charismatic, recklessly brave, to the point of being pig-headed. I first came across him in 2016, when he'd made a film about dirty money in Russia. I Zoomed him for BBC Newsnight, and I asked him directly about corruption in Russia. As you can hear in the clip, he doesn't mince his words. Hi, John. How much money is being sucked out of the Russian economy a year? Through corruption. I think it's at least something about $50 billion a year. How corrupt do you think is Mr. Vladimir Putin? He's a uh, czar of corruption. He's the basement of this corruption. And he's personally involved in corruption and he's encouraging our official for corruption because it's his way of ruling country. Putin denies this. 
Though only he has never been near power, so his hands are clean. And he's cut from a different cloth, clever, funny, irreverent, great online. So he's 21st century in a way that Putin and his cronies can never be. Navalny is no fool. You take on the Kremlin, you may die. This is something Navalny knows all too well, as he told me when I Zoomed him for BBC Newsnight. Boris Nemtsov was my friend, and he was shot dead maybe uh, 100, uh, 100 uh, metres from the Kremlin. I also asked him about the poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko. Of your British investigation about Mr... Uh, Mr. Litvinenko, and one of the conclusions on this investigation was that uh, Mr. P uh, Putin uh, personally probably involved in getting orders to Mr. Lugavoy uh, to commit such crimes. Navalny is a real and present danger to Vladimir Putin's grip on power. Listen to him wow the crowds in this clip from AP in 2013. <laughs> Navalny tells the Moscow crowd, one year ago when I was here at this protest, there were zero criminal cases against me. On September the 15th, at the next protest, there was one criminal case against me. Now, the six. Putin has captured power in this country, Navalny says. A man who's a corrupt feast and a hypocrite. A person deprived of any moral qualities. Well, drive him out of the Kremlin. And the Balney ends a speech like this. Putin! 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 Navalny is shouting, what's Putin? And the crowd comes back with vor, thief, vor, thief. But if you poke the Kremlin crocodile in the eye, beware. In 2020, Navalny is flying from the Siberian city of Tomsk to Moscow. The following clip is from Sky News, and it's pretty harrowing. That's the sound of Navalny crying out in agony as his brain and central nervous system is being attacked by Novichok, the very same weapons-grade nerve agent used in the Salisbury poisonings. For me, it's the sound, too, of democracy in Russia dying. You're listening to Taking on Putin, Episode 9, The Underpants Poisoner. I chewed the fat about Navalny with Ben Noble. He's an academic in Russian studies at University College London, and he's the co-author of the first book on Navalny. It's called Putin's Nemesis, Russia's Future? Question mark. Since the February invasion of Ukraine, life for Kremlin critics inside Russia has got far, far worse. I spoke to Ben before the invasion, where things were bad enough. Ben devised the standout characteristic about Navalny. He doesn't tell lies. I think the idea of him saying, here we tell the truth, resonates is because he knows that he's in a system that can give a toss about the truth. That he, his whole model is to call out officials who lie incessantly. And so he refers to telling the truth as being a radical thing in a system like Russia. He wants to be a normal politician and trying to be a normal politician means that he's exceptional in modern day Russia because he tries to tell the truth. He tries to say things like we need to be democratic if it says it in the constitution. He says officials shouldn't be stealing, that the wealth of the country needs to be distributed among the population. And so those things that would seem so unradical, boring even, in other societies stands out in Russia. And the reason why Navalny, there are other people saying that, lots of people saying the same things. He's able to do it because he's charismatic, because he's, he can come up with these witticisms and, and because he can um, pull together a team that's very effective at what they do. When I interviewed him, I said to Navalny, Putin never mentions you by name. And he kind of leaned forward and said in a whisper, that is because I am Lord Voldemort. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, he hasn't pulled that gag with me. But the reason why Putin doesn't name him is because he knows that uh, Putin knows that if he repeats Navalny's name, he's gonna sort of feed into the mystique. And so Putin has himself has to come up with these um, uh, semantic gymnastics and say he is the patient from Berlin. He is the aforementioned individual who claims has been poisoned. All this stuff. Because he doesn't want to, Putin doesn't want to be on TV naming Navalny. And so we're very much into this world of he who shall not be named, which is why he comes up saying that, you know, he, he refers to himself as being Lord Voldemort because these people who won't use his name because they realise the power in the name. So in this particular parallel universe, Alexei Navalny is Lord Voldemort and Vladimir Putin is Harry Potter. That can't be right. Putin looks much more like Gollum. My precious. I'll stop digging. Time for some Navalny facts. How old is he? Um, where did he go to college? Is he thick? Is he smart? Yep. Is he brave? Is he left wing? Is he right wing? Navalny was born in 1976. He doesn't go to the best university in the country, Moscow State University. He goes to the People's Friendship University. But he's clearly very bright. He tried to become a businessman in the 1990s. He is charismatic. He's intelligent. He's adaptable. The way that he's adapted to the use of social media shows us that he's not some um, Soviet dinosaur who isn't able to adapt. He's good fun, isn't he? And he's good fun. He's got a wicked sense of humour, which he isn't afraid of using in court. And so we've seen lots of his speeches going viral because that's who he is. He has a knack for saying things that are going to capture the imagination, not only of young people in Russia, but a larger segment that I think that some people people have given him credit for in the past. They might say, ah, Navalny, kids support him. But the way that he can engage, play with words, a very Russian trick, engage with Russian literature, uh, means that he's a character that he's cultural as well as being political. I think the most famous phrase that he coined is referring to United Russia, which is the Kremlin-sponsored party of power. They it's have majority Putin, in it's, the state. Duma. It's Putin's party. Putin's party. party even though he's not actually a member of the party, which is a wonderful sort of Russian postmodern uh, insight into how politics works there. Putin sets up the party to control the legislature, but doesn't join it because he doesn't want to be beholden to it. Anyway, uh, Alexei Navalny coined the phrase that United Russia was the party of crooks and thieves. And that is something that has stuck in people's minds. But the picture isn't all rosy. So there are some people who say that Navalny is actually kind of Vladimir Putin um, dressed up in fairy gold. True or false? It's absolute nonsense to say that he is some version of Vladimir Putin. The reason why Navalny has had to be quote-unquote dictatorial in the way that he leads his organisation is because he's functioning in a non-democratic society and he has to keep uh, his supporters, his associates on a tight leash so that they stay on the message are an effective weapon against uh, a regime that is willing, really as we see now, to do anything that it takes to crush any sign of opposition. So I can definitely see why some people might... Uh, claim that he is authoritarian, but I wouldn't judge him for it. And definitely, I think when we look at his values, it seems as though he is a Democrat. And so I don't think if he were to gain power, we'd just see Putin repeated. Anyway, actually, that game is a really dangerous game. What would Navalny be like in a democratic society? He's fighting for a democratic society, but he is currently fighting a, a, an authoritarian regime. What Navalny would look like, what his values would be if people had uh, a chance to select their politicians in free and fair elections, that's a whole other question. He calls people from the Caucasus, southern Russians, one would think, uh, first of all, of the Chechens as cockroaches. It's raining hard outside my house, proof that this section was recorded in England. Sorry about that. 2007, he releases a couple of videos when he's part of this group called Narod. And that is a nationalist movement. And it very much is part of the strand of his biography where he says statements that would be considered nationalist or xenophobic or racist. And these videos still exist. They're still up. He hasn't taken them down. He hasn't apologised for them. But if we're talking more broadly about some of the odious things that he has said, and I say odious because that's a word that Russians, some Russians would use for these statements, it's not just me bringing my Western gaze onto what's going on, um, he hasn't retracted those statements. And that can be 
the complex thing for people trying to make sense of Navalny. If he's a politician, why doesn't he apologise for these past statements so he can move forward? The reason why uh, is very tricky to unpack, but part of it is because of his personality, his dogged determination. He's, he, he's really reluctant to apologise, to make U-turns, to row back on things. Another interpretation is that he doesn't want to alienate the nationalist crowd, so he wants to try and remain as open as possible to as many constituencies as possible, because he realises that in the future if he is going to make a return to politics, then he doesn't want to have alienated a crowd by saying, actually, nationalists, I'm going to throw you under the bus. So we're all clear. I do not like what Navalny said back in 2007 one little bit. But that isn't the whole story. In 2010, Navalny goes to Yale University in the States on a young leaders course for political actors from around the world. Someone else on the programme is Marvin Rees, who's mixed race, a British Labour Party politician, and now the mayor of his hometown, Bristol. Can you explain to me how you got to know him and what do you think about that charge that Alexei's a racist? So I got to know him on the World Fellows programme, Yale World Fellows programme. The families that attended the programme all lived in the same uh, housing complex because we all had children. So it was myself, Ricardo Turan from Nicaragua, Lumumba DMP from Southern Sudan and uh, Alexei. And so we all lived together in that complex. That's how I got to Alexei. And then we shared uh, some, we shared our core seminar together. We attended classes together, audited a couple of classes, went to talks, took our trips, New York, DC. And I would say, actually, when I first got there, I didn't have a car. Um, and uh, Alexei took me shopping. Uh, he saw I didn't have a car and he offered to take me to supermarket, sat outside, waited while I went and got my supplies and then brought me back to the complex. Uh, in terms of the charge of, the, of being racist, it's, it, I, take, I take someone as I find them and I didn't meet someone who approached me with any sort of hate or uh, hostility. Um, I don't think we'd agree, no, no two people agree totally on their worldviews. Uh, but I met someone who treated me uh, with respect, treated me as a friend, helped me when I needed it, uh, but during, during my first few weeks in particular. I, saw, I, met, I met Alexei again after the program a couple of times at the reunions um, and sat with Alexei and Yulia at an airport when we happened to bump into each other when we were both in the same airport at the same time, remarkably. Um, and we just met and talked as friends. And so with me being a black man, him being a white man, um, that's how I experienced Alexei. With Dr. Ben Noble, I share my take on Navalny. My sense of him, I thought he was a cocky sod. And that's a compliment in that he's willing to risk his life and the safety of his family to stand up against this man, Vladimir Putin. And that is brave. It's your phrase, he's a cocky sod. And so if I'm going to use that, I'm putting it, just assume that I'm putting it in speech marks. But it's true. Am I on the money? Yes. Definitely. He's, he's cocky. It's the reason why he can end up inspiring love and hatred at the same time. Because for his supporters, his dogged determination, in your words, uh, cockiness, uh, that means that they uh, realise that he's somebody who's, n who's not willing to cower in front of the, the political leadership in the country at the moment. But also on the other side, he can alienate people. If somebody gets on the wrong side of him, he's going to go after them, he's not going to relent. The Russian presidential election campaign in the spring of 2018 was yet another production by the Kremlin's dark theatre of the absurd. Nemtsov's been shot dead, Kasyanov sex-shamed, and Navalny is prevented from running because of a trumped-up criminal case against him. The Russian state patsy media has accused him of all sorts of nonsense, of being an American spy, of being grossly corrupt. They've sent goons up to his dasha, or holiday home, where they've shot horrible and intrusive photographs of him and his wife, Yulia. Thugs splashed green dye in his eye, but hidden in the dye was a caustic agent that half blinded him. I went to Moscow working for BBC Panorama on a documentary we called Taking on Putin. It's about what happens to people in Team Navalny and the wider opposition who challenged the Kremlin's absolutism. 
One Democrat who dared to wear a Putin mask got tasered, then stabbed. Navalny's office manager was knocked out by a man with an iron bar. A third supporter who filmed the police arresting Navalny supporters was beaten by silent thugs. The wordlessness of the assaults, pointing to them being secret police. On reflection, what we were witnessing was Russian fascism in action. I first met Navalny in the flesh in Strasbourg in 2017. He was appealing to the European Court of Human Rights, suing the Russian government over the criminal case that banned him from election. He won the case. He wins all his cases in Europe. But Russia doesn't change its position. One year later, in 2018, I catch up with him in his Moscow office, shortly before the presidential elections. He's tall, fit. His piercing blue eyes burn with conviction. There's an intensity about him which is both frightening and, well, you know who he's up against. I'm appealing to people and trying to persuade them this is not an election. You cannot uh, participate in it because it's, it's disgrace, it's immoral, it's awful, it's ugly, and we cannot call this procedure an election. Is Russia a police state? Absolutely, 100%. 2020, he's on the road in the sticks in Siberia, meeting and greeting ordinary Russians sick of the corruption, sick of the same man in power for two decades more. Ben Noble takes up the story. So he's in Tomsk, which is a university town in Siberia, and then he gets on a plane which he thinks is going to take him back to Moscow. The only thing that he has that day is a glass of uh, a cup of tea while he's waiting for his plane. He gets on the flight and he starts feeling unwell, which quickly turns into him on the floor uh, howling with what appears to be pain. It becomes clear to the captain, to the uh, cabin crew that he's really not well, and so they uh, land in Omsk. They make an emergency landing because he's so because he's horribly so Ill. horribly ill. Uh, that we have various first-hand accounts of people looking at him and he's screaming, he's howling, he's on the floor. Luckily there's a nurse on board who is there who um, tries to stabilise him but they realise they're not going to be able to fly all the way to Moscow so they land in Omsk, which is still in Siberia. When they land, uh, the ambulance uh, takes him to an emergency hospital and he is given atropine. Uh, which turns out was uh, a very good choice because that may well have saved his life. You may remember atropine from the last episode. It's given to junkies to prevent the central nervous system from crashing. It's what saved the lives of Sergei and Yulia Skripal when they were poisoned by Russian state goons in Salisbury. So when he lands, they, of course, in the ambulance, don't know what's going on. They don't know whether he has overdosed or, or whether he's been poisoned, but they give him atropine. He ends up in the hospital, and it seems like, you know, normal medicine's taking its, um, its course. Uh, he's put into a medically induced coma, although uh, I think most of the reporting says that he was in a coma um, uh, even before then, but they want to make sure that he remains in a coma because he's in such a bad state. But then things start becoming a bit weird. Uh, so his wife comes to the hospital and the doctors are really reluctant to let her near him. Uh, his personal effects are being confiscated. The hospital also starts filling up with law enforcement people, but also plain clothed people who seem like they could be from the FSB. And so it seems really, really suspicious. Western leaders, in particular Germany's Angela Merkel, put pressure on Putin to let the comatose opposition leader be treated abroad. Eventually, the Kremlin relents. Anyway, Navalny is taken to Berlin. He's diagnosed with poisoning, his initial diagnosis of poisoning with a cholinesterase inhibitor, which is either something that you would find in a fertilizer all the way through to a toxic nerve agent. So it, it means that uh, when the Germans say that Navalny has been poisoned 
by uh, something from the Novichok group um, that is the confirmation of the suspicion that lots of people had that he has been poisoned by a military grade nerve agent and it is the same group, Novichok, as uh, was used against the Skripals in 2018 in Salisbury. Navalny takes months to recover in Germany. Back in Omsk, two of the Russian doctors who saved his life end up, before their time, dead. And to Bellingcat, the investigative website manned by super geeks. They go to town and work out a group of Russian secret policemen who have been stalking Navalny for years, following him around Russia. And they reveal that they work for a secret chemical warfare unit. But that's not all. Hello, Konstantin Borisovich. Konstantin Borisovich. No, no, no. Yes, right. yes. The second voice you're hearing is a high up in the Russian secret state. This is Ustinov Maxim Segovich, aide to Nikolai Platonovich Petrushov. I received your number from Vladimir Mikhailovich Bogdanov. I apologize for the early hour, but I urgently require 10 minutes of your time. Oh, no, it's not. It's Navalny himself pretending to be a high up in the Russian secret state. The call is taking place at Sparrow Fart, and the gormless FSB goon gives the game away. As I've said, Navalny is a cocky sod. Maxim, the high up he's playing, wants to know exactly how the team poisoned Navalny. And on which item of clothing was your focus on? Which garment had the highest risk factor? The underpants. The underpants? A, a, a risk factor in what sense? Where the concentration of Novichok could be the highest. Well, the underpants. Do you mean the inside or the outside? Well, we were treating the inside. This is what we were doing. Well, imagine some underpants in front of you. Which part did you treat? The inside, where the groin is. The groin? Well, the crotch, as they call it. Uh, there are some sort of seams there. By the seams. Wait, this is important. Who gave you the order to treat the codpiece of the underpants? We figured this out on our own. Uh, they told us to work on the inner side, the inside of the underpants. I'm writing it down. The inside. OK. Now, do you remember the colour of the underpants? Blue? I'm not sure. And their whole? I mean, theoretically, we could give them back. We're not going to do this. But they're undamaged and everything is OK with them? Yes, all is clear. Here's Ben Noble. The cherry on the cake is Navalny himself calling up somebody who is part of this FSB assassination unit, according to Bellingcat, uh, and he gets him to admit... Um, uh, on, uh, he's on, on the record, no, he's no, pretending. No. Well, he calls it pretending to be the senior guy in the FSB, and he does. It's again a sign of Navalny's uh, sort of balls that he would call up and in the moment say uh, that you know, look, I'm this person, I'm this incredibly important person. He gets the tone exactly right, the language exactly right. This member of the team, uh, uh, Navalny, um, gets the, the member of the team to say, well, look, we put the poison in his underpants. And that is just an extraordinary omission that is then released um, uh, after the original Bellingcat investigation. But the idea that Navalny can get on tape somebody who is claimed by Bellingcat to have tried to poison him, tried to kill him, um, uh, really is, is extraordinary. And I think also it's one of those moments, understandably, imagine how... Um, I mean, saying annoyed you'd be is, is putting it lightly, but Navalny speaks to somebody who tried to kill him. And if there was any doubt beforehand, then there certainly wasn't from that point. The Russian secret state did their best to kill Navalny by novi chocking his underpants. That means its leader, Vladimir Putin, is the underpants poisoner. Navalny only lived because he got flown out to Germany. But in January 2021... He flew back to Russia, uncertain arrest, uncertain conviction, and uncertain life, by which I mean probable death. But for this cocky sod, there's no other option. He knows that if he stays in exile, he will never evict Putin from the Kremlin. The moment he lands, he's locked up by a court and sent to prison. 
As he's about to be led away to the penal colony, he makes a gesture to his wife, Yulia. Here's Ben Noble. Well, he makes the sign of a heart with his fingers, but he also draws a heart on the glass when he's in the cage, although it's a glass cage, in court to his wife. Um, Which is a beautiful romantic moment. It really is. And in that whole moment, you also see Navalny the man. And the reason why he stands out is because in that moment where lots of people would be cowering, they'd be understandably crying, concerned for their future, he's there with a smile on his face because he knows exactly how this is going to turn out. Navalny is daring the Kremlin to kill him. And for the time being, he's winning the dare in that he's still alive. But he's been hit with more fake charges, and this week a Russian court confirmed he'll be kept in a harsher prison for an extra nine years. On brand, Navalny told the judge, this war, just like your courts, is totally built on lies. That raises big questions about the legal system under Putin. Justice in Russia is a joke with a capital J. Bill Browder is a venture capitalist who made a ton of money when the old Soviet Union morphed into the new Russia. Then he uncovered massive corruption against his company. And then the Russian state came for his lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky. You know, in my case, why do I do what I'm doing? Um, Because a young man who worked for me was murdered in the most terrific way. And and I can't stand that. And the, and the, and the, the guilt that, that, that I feel drives me every day towards action. Um, We all have our own reasons for doing what we're doing. You know, my my reasons for going after Putin are all come back to Sergei Magnitsky. And it also comes back to the way in which he has tried to change the truth about what happened to Sergei Magnitsky after Sergei, after he was murdered, after Putin's goons murdered Sergei. You know, they tried to, uh, Black and Sergei's name. They tried to change the whole story. They tried to cover it up. And that, that you know, killing Sergei was one thing, but the way in which they then tried to destroy his reputation, put him on trial in the first ever trial at, against a dead man in the history of Russia after he was killed. All these things just, you know, pump me f- full of more and more energy to, um, to stop them and to fight this. How, so, yes, so the, they... Did they change the law to try a dead man? They, 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 they changed the law to try a dead man. And Sergei Magnitsky was the first dead man um, to, to um, be under this new law. Did they find the corpse guilty or not guilty? They found him guilty. But this is a joke, a dark joke, a black joke. But this is a joke, surely. How can you, what legal system can possibly try a dead man? Well, the um, the legal system, you know, you know, back in in Roman times, they did that. Um, Pope Formosus um, was put on trial. They dug up his body and put him in a chair and found him guilty. And the next time that happened was Sergei Magnitsky in Russia. It's very hard to see how Navalny, the cocky sod, can ever be free again under a justice system run by Vladimir Putin. This, by the way, is a charge the Kremlin, of course, deny. To be fair to Navalny, back in 2021, as he's being led to prison, he's one more trick up his sleeve. His team release a video, Putin's Palace, which has had 123 million views to date. The video alleges that Vladimir Putin's oligarch cronies have built him a $1 billion palace on the shores of the Black Sea. Effectively, the video alleges that Putin is the biggest crook in Russian history, an allegation that Putin and all the oligarchs named by Navalny deny. It's screamingly funny. Navalny's anti-corruption network inside Russia has been rolled up. The online journalists who applauded his scoops have been arrested or threatened or have escaped into exile. The cocky sod himself is locked up in prison. How does Ben Noble see the future pan out? What's going to happen to Alexei Navalny? He, it looked when he was in prison that his cockiness, 
his balls would come to the fore and he would be in control of his own death. He went on hunger strike He um, because he was uh, protesting against the fact that he wasn't being given his legal right to have his own medical team see him in prison. And he has said before that he approves of, of hunger strike as being a very um, uh, uh, moral way of, of standing up to a, of a, a, an, immoral, an immoral system. At the end of the day, uh, luckily, he uh, called off the hunger strike. Uh, and so it looks like he will remain in prison for a very long time. There are other criminal cases that the state can use to add more years, to c- continue adding more years. Of course, I'm in no position to say whether um, the state would want to do anything that would bring forward uh, his death in prison. Who knows? We should resist the idea that Alexei Navalny's fate is going to be decided in the West. It's going to be decided in Russia, and it's going to be decided probably... By Vladimir Putin. The master of the Kremlin has passed a new constitutional law allowing him to stay in power if he keeps on getting elected until 2036, when he will be a fit and sprightly 83 years old. Before the February invasion, I asked Tom Tugendat, the Tory MP who chairs the Commons Foreign Affairs Committee, to gaze into his crystal ball. How do you think Putin's going to leave the Kremlin? in a box. Uh, He can't retire. Like all dictators, he's now killed too many. He can't retire. He's got the same problem that Shakespeare wrote about, that every king has written about, that every poet, that every, you know, playwright has written about for hundreds of years, which is there comes a point in every imperial life, every royal life, when you realise that retirement means death. And then, in February 2022, Vladimir Putin makes the greatest single mistake of his life. That's our next episode, How to Lose a War. I'm going back to Kyiv and the war, and that takes time. So see you for the next episode in two weeks' time. Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin and the FSB deny poisoning Alexei Navalny. They deny any wrongdoing. Vladimir Putin and all the people identified by Navalny in his video, Putin's Palace, deny corruption, deny wrongdoing. You've been listening to Taking on Putin, Episode 9, The Underpants Poisoner. Thanks to BBC Panorama, BBC Newsnight, Sky News, AP and Bellingcat. Taking on Putin is a podcast series written and reported by me, John Sweeney, for Black Dog Woof Woof Productions. It's produced by Chalk and Blade in London. The executive producer is Laura Sheeta, with other production by the team. It's mixed and sound designed by Alex Port Felix, with original music by Thomas Hewitt-Jones. I've launched a crowdfunder to help fund this podcast, Taking on Putin. There are loads of costs. Lawyers, checking things out, making sure that it gets to all the right platforms, making sure that the people that I'm working with, and I, are safe from legal and other threats. I'm not going to spell them out, but use your imagination. So, if you're going to help me tell this story, please help me crowdfund it. In your search engine... Dial in Crowdfunder, taking on Putin with me, John Sweeney. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you for coming along for the ride. The Kremlin won't like it. Take care and love from London.